Greetings, 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 greetings. Pastor James, what's going on, my brother? Greetings. God bless you. On a chilly Thursday evening. Um, we didn't do this yesterday. We had uh, a family emergency come up in the last minute. And so, um, but nevertheless, we're here today. And we're going to start with prayer. Spirit of the living God, we thank you and we bless you again. Uh, we have been giving your name the praise all day. We thank you for who you are and we thank you for who you are to us. And as we go forth in this teaching, Lord, I pray that whoever watches and whoever watches later will get an understanding, a working knowledge of their salvation, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and questions they may have been pondering in their mind will be answered through this teaching series. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. And we pray that the eyes of the understanding of your people be enlightened to the knowledge of the truth. Give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation as we go through this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So everybody have a good week. So far, I pray that you have. Amen. Pray that everybody has had a great week, a blessed week. And I, I pray that the rest of your week, which consists of one day, is even better. <laughs> Amen. 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 So we're going to go ahead and, and get into it. So um, if you see... Scrolling across the screen, we're talking about the study of the gospel. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? Um, if you ask most Christians, they'll say, well, it's this or that. But can you articulate the gospel to unbelievers? Do you know how to answer basic questions when asked? And that's one of the things we want to do with this teaching. We want to show what salvation entails. Um what it is that, what is it that you believe? Do you know why you believe what you believe? And so um, there's an author, uh, I've read a few of his books. He's a Christian apologist. He defends the faith. His name's Josh McDowell. And he, he said one time, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the most wicked, one of the most vicious, one of the most heartless, watch this, hoaxes ever brought upon the minds of men and women. He said, it's either that or it's the most fantastic fact in history. And the resurrection has been proven. The resurrection of Jesus Christ have been proven by eyewitnesses to be a fact. So since the advent of Jesus Christ, men and women have been willing to die for the gospel's truth. They have been willing to be martyred, thrown to the lions, pulled apart by wild, wild horses, uh, burned at the stake. For the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the truth of it, started out with 12 men and they knew Jesus best. They walked with him. They slept with him. You know, they talked with him. They, they were mentored by Christ himself and they saw the resurrected Lord and they risked. As a matter of fact, they gave their lives for the truth of the fact of the gospel. All 12, except John, who was banished to the Isle of Patmos. And so the gospel, this gospel that we preach, this gospel that we talk about, this gospel that uh, the Muslims say is not real, this gospel that people try to tear down, this gospel that all of these uh, different religions try to dispute, this gospel that we're talking about tonight has changed millions upon millions of lives of people who have responded to his message. The gospel of Jesus Christ came, claims to be uh, the exclusive and only way to God and has offended those 
who have a pluralistic mindset. Jesus himself said in John 14, chapter 14, verse 6, he, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Peter echoed the sentiment in Acts chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Peter preaching, he said, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. And he said this, watch this. He said, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among people which by we must be saved. So we ask tonight, what is the gospel? What must I do to be saved? Did God choose me or did I choose him? I know the song uh, we sang in the church and the old folks used to sing, I'm so glad I made Jesus my choice, but did he choose us? Or we woke up one day and choose him. How, questions like, how does the gospel affect my current life? What does the gospel mean for my future? Can I lose my salvation? There are some of the questions that this teaching is designed to answer. Amen? So this teaching can be broken down into uh, four separate segments. One, the definition of the gospel and the five basic points of the gospel the theological past aspects of the gospel, the theological present aspects of the gospel, and the future aspects of the gospel, right? And so why is this important? You might be saying, well, what, what's so, why do we need to know this? What's so important about this? For people that may be watching or will come in later who have not heard or believed the message of the gospel, you, you must understand that your eternal Destiny depends on it. Heaven or hell, torment or bliss, with God or without him, it all depends on your choice. Some people might say, and I'm sure when people saw this, I'm sure this is the consensus of many people. Oh, oh shoot, I, I already know the gospel. So why is this topic important to me? First thing I would say to people who ask that question we are a forgetful people and we we need constant reminders and constant review of even the basics so the scripture says in second peter uh chapter 1 verse 12 and 13 peter said this to the saints he said therefore i will always remind you about these things even though you know them and are established in the truth you now have i think it is right as long as I am in this bodily tent to wake you up with a reminder. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're trying to wake some folk up with a reminder because as I look across the landscape and I'm out and about and listening and seeing, a lot of people don't know what the gospel is. And next I will ask you this. For the ones who say you know the gospel, do you know it well enough to share the gospel with other people? We're supposed to share the gospel with other people. Amen? So what is the gospel? The English word for gospel, the English word gospel is from the Greek word euangelon, euangelon, right? And in essence, that word means just good news, right? And in the New Testament, it specifically refers to the God's good news to people about Jesus Christ. And it can also refer to one of the four books written about the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, right? And so Apostle Paul defines the gospel this way. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, he says, now I want to make it clear to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preach to you, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that's the gospel. Amen? And I got to tell you, the, the gospel is more than just your one-way ticket to heaven. The gospel of Jesus Christ is an invitation to a new life. It's an invitation to have your sins forgiven and be, be in an eternal relationship with a loving and eternal God. The gospel message can be broken down into five points. And I know you heard this but we're going we're gonna to explain it. God loves you and has a plan and a purpose 
for your life. Have you heard that before? So that's the first piece of good news, that he loves us. He has a plan for our life. Jesus said in John 3, 16, for this is the way God loved the world, that he gave his only, his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. So someone said, uh, made a good saying and said, people matter to God. People are valuable in God's sight. How valuable are people to God? So as uh, this verse just stated, they are valuable enough for God to give something that was valuable. God gave his one and only son so that we might have eternal life. For those of us that are parents, how valuable, how valuable would something have to be for me to turn over the life of one of my kids? to turn over the life of Kaisha or Kalisa. Oh, how valuable would something have to be to trade their life for? Jesus said in John 10 and 10, I have come that you might have not just life, but that you might have life abundantly. So your, your life changes, your standard of living changes, how you view and conceptualize life changes when you become a partaker with Christ's nature through the acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you got to understand, family, that God's plan for uh, us is life, not only in this life, but eternal life, which means we live forever and abundant life. And you got to understand, without God, and I'm going to say this again, without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. And without meaning, life has no significance, and life has no hope. So we need God. And so that goes to the second point. We understand that people are sinners and separated from God by sin. Sin keeps us separated from the Father. You know, I see all the time people, anybody, the drug dealers, you look at the, the BET award, the drug dealers, the everybody, the rappers, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 pray, I pray to God, I, I thank God. But if we're living in sin prior to salvation, we are separated from God. And so that's why we need the gospel to reconcile or bring man back into God's good graces through the acceptance of the gospel. The bad news is that people are sinners and separated from God because Paul said that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I know people say that when somebody does something and somebody might say something about it well you know all of sin and falling short of his glory but that's not talking about us who are now born again that's talking about our prior state before salvation all of us were born into sin and shaped in iniquity and so we all fell short of the glory of god all of us right and then he said in romans 6 and 23 that the wages of sin is death and sometimes it's not only spiritual death, it's natural death too. Now notice, this verse didn't say that a few people sin. It, said, uh, it didn't say that some people sin or even most people sin. It said that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, fallen short of God's standards. And also the payoff, the payday, the paycheck, or the consequence of sin is death. So from the biblical perspective, not only do people do bad things called sin, but they are sinners by nature and they are depraved. All the physical death that we see in the world is a consequence of sin. All this death, all of the destruction, even the dying, now we're seeing the leaves dying. All of that is a consequence uh, of death. Amen? It's a consequence of sin. So as bad as it is, there is a greater consequence of sin, which is spiritual death. So you can die, your body can die, but God knows you don't want spiritual death because if you're in Christ, you can die a physical death, but your spiritual life will be eternal. Amen? Yeah. So you got to understand that spiritual death separates 
people from God eternally in a fiery place of punishment. The Bible refers to this in Revelation 20 as the second death or the lake of fire. And we cannot really relate to the good news or the gospel until you understand the bad news. Let me say this again. You can't understand the good news until you understand the bad news. Okay. Let me show you like this. If a cure for terminal cancer was discovered, it would be good news, right? If they came out with a cure for cancer tomorrow, it would be good news. But if I have terminal cancer myself, it's more than just good news. It's life-changing great news. Are you getting it? It's fantastic. It's life-saving. It's life-changing. That's how the gospel is for people who understand that they have the cancer of sin. Yeah, sin is a type of cancer that's terminal. It will and it's gonna kill you. Amen? That brings me to the next point. The next point is an extension of, the, of, the, of this bad news. No amount of good works can earn a person's way to heaven and establish a relationship with God. I don't care how good you are, how much you've done, how, how much you give, I don't care. That will not give you access to the Father. In Ephesians, Paul says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace we're saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is a gift of God. It's not from works so that none of us can boast or brag. Amen? And so one of the major problems with all of the religions in the world and even religious people in the church is the belief that certain types of good works or enough good works will merit our way into heaven. No, sir. Baptism will not save you. Having Christian parents will not save you. Going to church every Sunday will not save you. Giving money to the poor will not save you. And I could go on and on and on and on. Yet the Bible over and over again states that it is faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, that saves and that faith must be personally held. Nobody can hold it for you. You can't, it, it can't, you can't use your mama's faith. You can't use granny's faith. You can't use auntie's faith. You can't use your cousin, your brother's or your sibling's faith. It's personally held. It's on you. Amen. And the fourth point, I have to get you to understand that the way God chose to deal with our sin problem is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Paul said in Romans chapter five, verse eight, he said, but God demonstrates, how did God, de how did God show us that he loved us? Paul said that God demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, amen? And so the biblical concept of this point is referred to as the substitutionary atonement of Jesus' death. His death paid the penalty or the price that God required for our sins. It was him for us, or better yet, it was Jesus instead of us. In the Old Testament, which was a type and a shadow of Christ, animal, they had animal sacrifices for sin once a year. And that illustrated this concept. One example is the Passover. There were instructions that God gave to Israel in the Old Testament when they were in slavery to the Egyptians in Egypt. God commanded them that a lamb without any, any defects was to be killed. And the blood of that lamb had to be spread or applied to the doorpost and the lintel post of the house. And for the houses that made these sacrifices and applied the blood, when the death angel came and passed over the house, the ones who had the blood applied to their house, the death angel passed over. 
But for the ones which were the Egyptians that did not have, had not made the sacrifice and didn't have the blood of the, 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 the lamb on their doorposts, their firstborn children were struck with death. So in this way right here, God delivered Israel from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. You can read about it in Exodus chapter 12. But now in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is referred to in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7 as our Passover sacrifice. So when God sees the blood of Jesus applied to our life, death passes by and we're given life, eternal life. Jesus said this in John chapter 5, verse 24. I tell you the solemn truth. The one who hears my message and believes the one who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned, but has crossed over from death to life. What is that telling us? That's telling us that people who haven't been born again are walking around dead. It, I mean, it's just the truth. The Walking Dead that we see on, on, on uh, AMC, that's not original. The Walking Dead are people that have are, are dead in the trespasses of their sins and have not yet been, their spirits have been quickened or made alive by Christ. Next thing we have to understand, uh, and, and it's the last point we got to receive, you got to receive Jesus by faith to receive the eternal life that God has for us and start our new relationship with God. You got to first receive Christ. So John said in John uh, chapter one, verse 12, he said, but to all who have received him and those who believed on his name, he has be given them right to become the sons of God. So we that believe on his name that have been redeemed, we have a right to be the sons of God. Amen. Or the children of God. So the gospel requires a faith response to the message. Once you hear the message, you are obligated to respond. Amen? You have to respond, a personal trust response in, in which we receive the benefits of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And I pray that all of us at some point in our life, if you haven't yet, say yes to God. Yes, I believe that. I'm a sinner and I need salvation. Yes, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And yes, I receive him as my personal savior to fulfill his plan of goodness for my life. So let's look at five basic points of the gospel. One, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Two, people are sinners and separated from God by sin. Three, no amount of good works uh, can earn your way to heaven. Number four, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And number five, you have to receive Jesus by faith to receive the eternal life that God has for you. You cannot bypass Jesus and go straight to God because you will not get at, you have to go through Jesus to get access to the Father, right? And if you don't know him, just pray this prayer. Father, I know that I have broken your laws and my sins have separated me from you. And I'm truly sorry. Lord, please forgive me. And I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died for my sins and was resurrected from the dead. And I now ask you to enter my life and give me the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And for those who have not responded to God's plan of salvation, I'm going to tell you this. I would challenge you to do this. Get answers to questions that you have from somebody who have already believed in Christ already. The questions that you have, talk to somebody that's walking it like they talk it. Amen? So we want to look at uh, past aspects of salvation from a theological point of view. What does that mean? Past aspects of salvation refers to what God did in your life prior to you placing faith in Jesus Christ. It wasn't when you came to the altar or whatever you gave your life to Christ that he dealt with you before then. Somebody might say, well, who care about the past in this regard? So what? And I would tell them this. We need to understand that it was God's plan that we be saved. 
He's the one that gets the credit. He's the one who gets the glory, not us. And there is nothing worse than somebody taking credit for something they didn't do. So why did God, why does God get the credit? Why does God get the glory uh, for what he's did for our life, for where we are? There are words we have to understand. Election, predestination, and the drawing of God. It's all to the praise and glory of his grace, right? Election or predestination is God's choice of who would be saved. It comes from the Greek word ekloge, ekloge. Paul said in Ephesians chapter one, verse three, blessed is the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, in Christ. For he chose, watch this. Now here's what you got to listen to. He said, for <clears throat> he chose us in Christ. When did he choose us in Christ? Before the foundation of the world. Why did he do it? So that we would be holy and unblemished in his sight in love. Amen. So when did God choose us? He chose us before. He chose us before we were even born. And what this is called is election or predestination. He predestined us. He predetermined that we would be in the kingdom of his dear son. And the question that a lot of theologians have asked is on what basis did God choose some individuals and then choose others? So there are two camps that answers this question. Okay, one which is called the Arminian view, feels that God looked down the corridor of time and saw ahead of time those who would have faith and chose them on the basis of that. Amen? Another view is the Calvinist view. It's, it, it, see, it, it sees it as simply God's sovereign choice without regard to anything that an individual may or may not do, including faith. And it seems that uh, a person must leave it in some senses to the mystery of God, trusting in God's justice and trusting in God's goodness. Now, the two passages that deal with this question indicate that God's choice is not based on our works. Amen? Romans 9 and 16. This is what Romans 9 and 16 says. So then, it does not depend on human will or effort but on God who shows mercy. But it's based on the foreknowledge of people. Romans 8 and 29 says, and this sums it up for me, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen? And so, the drawing of God, God draws us to him. The Bible says no man can come to God unless the Holy Spirit draws him. We have been drawn to God. And that drawing of God is something that brings us to salvation. Yeah. John 6 and 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So we have to be drawn to God, right? In the drawing process, one can conclude that the idea of giving light to the truth and conviction of sin. Matter of fact, John um, chapter 16, verse 8 says, when he comes, he's going to convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because they don't believe in me. Amen? So the main point is this, family. God not only chose us before the creation of the world, but he also took an active role in what we call pre-conversion work by drawing us, giving us the light of truth and convicting us of sin. I know I hear people in the church say, you know, Holy Spirit convicted me. No, we don't get convicted while we're saved. You're convicted when you are in the world, convicted of sin the nature of sin. I remember the night I got saved. 
I was off out doing what I do. And the Holy Spirit began to draw me. I didn't even understand what was going on, but I knew that something was happening. And then I didn't have language for it because I didn't know what it was, but I know it was drawing me out of the environment that night I was in and drawing me home when the Lord saved me. And so this drawing, what it does, it puts us into a position by which we could be receptive to the gospel. The God who shined physical light into creation, the one who said, let there be light and there was light, is the same God who shines the light of the glory of Jesus Christ into our hearts. Second Corinthians chapter four says, for, for God who said, let light shine out of the darkness have shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen? Like, do y'all understand that? Any questions thus far? Any questions thus far? Anybody got any questions? Okay. We talk about present aspects of salvation. Present aspects of salvation refers to what happens the moment of salvation and the process of how we flesh out or walk out life as a Christian. How do we do it? What happens the moment you give your life to Christ? So we can divide the theological present aspects of salvation into two things. One, the conditions for salvation and eternal life and the results of salvation or eternal life. And this is important. Why? Because it addresses the condition of salvation and the immediate, you do know salvation has an immediate impact on our life of receiving that salvation. And it radically changes our life into new relationship with almighty God. Because we didn't have a real, I don't care how much you said you prayed and did this and that. You did not have a relationship with God prior to you accepting the atonement of Jesus Christ, his work on the cross. And so what are the conditions? The conditions of salvation include both faith and repentance. You got to have faith and you have to repent. Faith, which comes from the Greek word pistis, can be defined as belief or trust. Amen. And so in regard to eternal salvation, faith and trust is just the belief of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. It is the only means of how we receive the gift of eternal life. Faith or belief is mentioned in the New Testament nearly 200 times as the sole condition of eternal life. You don't have to do no flips. You ain't, you ain't got to walk around the, the wall of Jericho and blow a horn seven times. You ain't got to uh, swim backwards and do some somersaults. No, you just got to have faith and belief. Amen? Yeah. We look in the book of Acts. Uh, in Acts 16, chapter 16, verse 30. Uh, Paul and Silas in a jail in Philippi. They were in the prison. The Bible said, then the Philippian jailer brought them outside and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul and Silas told them, he said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Now watch this. I want you to hear this. Not only you, but you and your household. So our salvation independently affects not only us, but it affects those in our house. It affects your children. It affects those closest to you. Amen? What is repentance? What does it mean to repent? It don't mean to say I'm sorry. It means to change your mind. It comes from the Greek word metanoia. Metanoia, right? So in regard to salvation, repentance is a genuine change of mind and heart about who Christ is. And instead of putting our trust in ourselves, we transform our trust in us to trust in him. Amen. We stop trusting in 
you know, uh, we try to make ourselves out to be some type of Lord. We we try to make ourselves to be some kind of God. And, you know, we say the we're God and goddesses and we can't even, we still, go, you still got a doctor's appointment. How you being God? How, how you being God? You, you can't even save, you can't even, your children sick and you in the hospital crying and snotting. If you God, you're supposed to be able to fix them. You can't even help yourself. But that's pride. It's the pride of life that causes us to try to think that way. Amen. We have to understand only th my life did not change until I said, came to the realistic conclusion, I can't help myself. I can't fix myself. And I don't care what I do and how I try to straighten up. I can't do it myself. I can modify my behavior. Where and I'm when I'm in wherever I'm at, I can modify my behavior. I can fit in and acclimate to different environments, right? But I couldn't change what was on the inside of me. When I embraced Islam, I could I could uh, sell the bean pies. I could wear a bow tie and a suit and, and and wear some oils. But it didn't change my heart. My heart was still corrupt. My thinking was still corrupt. Only when I embrace what Jesus Christ has to offer that my entire being begin to change. Peter told, when Peter preached the first sermon on the day of Pentecost, he said in Acts 2 and 38, he said, repent every one of y'all and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So fruits or good works uh oh are normally expected as a result of genuine repentance so when people say yeah i'm saved i look for fruit not judging their character no i'm looking for fruit because if you say you're an apple tree oranges ain't going to fall from you grapefruit are not going to fall from you if you say you're the one that say that you repented, I'm saved now. So there gotta be some fruits so of good works, right? Luke 3 and 8 says this. Jesus said, therefore produce fruit. Watch this. Listen to me. If you don't hear nothing else, hear this. Jesus said, produce fruit consistent with repentance. <laughs> How you navigate in life should be consistent with your repentance. And don't start saying to yourselves, this is Jesus talking, we have Abraham as our father. He's talking to the Jews. He said, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children from Abraham from these stones. And he, he was really letting them know, y'all don't, if y'all don't get some act right, I'll bring the Gentiles in and they, which he did, which were the Gentiles, and now we are the adopted seed of Abraham. So all of the promises of God that God made to Abraham, we are now recipients of those promises by the spirit of adoption because we have been adopted into the kingdom of his dear son. Oh my God. So what is the relationship between faith and repentance? In, in, in short, in regards to salvation, you could consider them synonym, uh, synonyms, right? With a little different emphasis. So faith in Jesus Christ <clears throat> emphasizes our trust in him, right? While repentance emphasizes our heart posture. Repentance emphasizes that we have a change of heart about Jesus in regards to who he is, what we are, and what he has done for us. Amen? Here's an illustration. Do I have a coin? I don't have a coin in my pocket. If you, we would see, look at salvation as a coin, right? With two sides on it. One side is repentance, the other side is faith. One coin, right? 
but two aspects of that coin. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 21, the writer says, I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the result of that? The result of our salvation include the theological concepts. Watch these words. If you're taking notes, write this down. Regeneration, justification, redemption, reconciliation, and sanctification. Let me say it again. Regeneration, justification, redemption, reconciliation, and sanctification. You know, sanctified. Uh, the word regeneration comes from a Greek word that can be defined as the work of God, which gives new life to the one who believes. When you believe, you receive new life, right? Paul said in Titus chapter three, verse five, God saved us not by works of righteousness that we have done, but on the basis of God's mercy through the washing of the new birth and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So just like with election, a lot of theologians have debated the issue in timing and the nature of regeneration. Asking if regeneration comes before faith or does it follow faith, right? And we ain't gonna be able to solve that issue here tonight. But one, I wanna caution you on is not to put a gap of time between one event and the other. In my words, or in my view, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's not before faith or after faith, it's with faith. Once you, once by faith you receive the salvation from God, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? G regeneration is a more, it's more of a logical consequence of faith than a temporal one. When we believe that we will be sealed with the Holy Spirit. We have to believe that. Ephesians 1 and 13 says, In him, you, we, also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When did this happen, y'all? When we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and when we believed. So all of that, you got to go and tarry for the Holy Ghost? No, you don't. You get the Holy Ghost when you receive salvation. The next word is justification. It means to announce a favorable verdict, to declare us righteous. Listen, we don't have to work. Those of us that saved don't have to work for righteousness. We've been declared righteous, right? In the New Testament, justification has the idea of being declared righteous based on the redemptive ministry of Jesus Christ. Paul said in Romans chapter five, verse one, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we got peace with God. See, because of what he did on the cross and because we believed in it by faith and accepted him into our life, now we have been declared, we can't make ourselves righteous. He has declared us righteous. Now, instead of being an enemy with God, the Bible says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, if you ever been to court, you know at the end of the trial, the judge hit the gavel, boom, and he says, guilty or not guilty. In this case, in our case, in your case, God hit the gavel and said, righteous, based on the penalty that was paid by Jesus Christ. So, redemption in essence means to buy with a price, to purchase with a price. It comes from the Greek word apolutrosis, right? In the New Testament, apolutrosis or redemption is the price that Jesus paid by his blood to rescue us from the penalty of sin and make us as owned by God. We do not belong to ourselves. God owns us. We are truly his property. Paul states in Ephesians 1 and 7, in him, Jesus Christ, 
we have redemption through his blood, number one, the forgiveness of our trespasses, number two, according to the riches of his grace. So in the New Testament times, it's estimated that approximately one third or one half to one third to one half of the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. So potential owners would come to the auctions that people had looking to buy a slave or purchase a slave. When they purchased the slave, the slave was uh, uh, legally owned now by the master who purchased it, who paid for it. In a similar way, God purchased us, amen? The price that he paid was the blood of Jesus Christ. And as a result, we're owned by God. And so as Paul explains, we were, past tense, slaves of sin, but now we are slaves of God. Amen? Uh, when we look at the next word, reconciliation. Reconciliation means change in relationship from hostility to harmony and peace between two parties, right? God and man. It comes from the Greek word katalage. That's reconciliation in the Greek, katalage. Paul says in Romans 5 and 10, for if while we were enemies, who were we enemies with, y'all? We were enemies to God. He says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more since we have now been reconciled will we be saved by his life? Amen? We were reconciled to God through his death and we have been saved by his life. So the two parties who were at war, God was against us and we was against God, right? We were at war with God. How did we war with Almighty God? We By breaking his standards, sinning against him and his laws. He was at war with us, bringing judgment and wrath. They want a pretty picture. By the death of Jesus, we have a peace treaty. No longer are we at war with God, but now we have peace. No longer are we enemies with God, but he's, we're now his friends. <laughs> no longer are we in, we're not in a relationship with God, but we have been reconciled in right relationship with him. Amen? And then we look at uh, the, uh, sanctification basically means to set apart. We've been set apart from the Greek word, Hagiosmos. The born again believer is set apart in right standing before God. That's positional sanctification. We have been positioned, right? Before the living God. We have been put, that's positional sanctification. Paul said to the church of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said to the church of God at Corinth, to those who are what? Sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours, right? And also, we've been set apart for a life of holiness. That's practical sanctification, holiness in this world. Romans 6 and 19 says, I am using a human analogy because of the weakness of our flesh. For just as we offer the parts of ourselves, our bodies, right? as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness. So now we offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. It results in us being set apart for his glory. Amen. Um, somebody said it like this, just, just be. Just be what? Be who you are. We done been declared righteous. Now, what do we do? We live righteously. Like my wife said, walk it like you talk it. We have been purchased by God, so we submit to his lordship. We have been reconciled with God, so pursue your relationship with him. We are sanctified. Now we need to go and live holy lives. And the lift, the lift, it can go on and on. We just be. Be who we are. Who are we? We're not who we were. We're who we are now. Set apart sanctified. We've been 
redeemed, right? We've been brought back. We've been reconciled back to God. And we have to understand that. Now, lastly, the future aspects of salvation refer to what happens after we die. It's important. Now, this is important because it can give us confidence about our future and security in our relationship with God. Glorification comes from the Greek word doxazo, right? Glorification or doxazo is the future state of salvation, right? In which a believer has received an immortal body and has been morally perfected. We're not, we haven't been glorified yet. We're not in a stage of glorification, not yet. That's why the Bible says it does not appear, appear what we shall be, but when Jesus comes, then we'll be like him in a glorified body and a perfected, we'll be perfected. The body will be immortal, right? And morally perfected. We won't make immoral choices. We won't be immoral anymore. We'll be made moral. We'll be like Jesus. Amen. Paul said in Romans, Romans 8 and 30, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So who did he predestine, if you've been listening? Us. Who did he call? Us. Who did he justify? Us, believers. And so he said those who he justified, he also glorified. Amen? Now, notice in this verse, ain't no dropouts. And in fact, Listen, I, I, I know y'all didn't catch it. The last term I said glorify in the past tense. He used the past tense because this is a certain reality, right? All of those of us who have been predestined will also be glorified. There's no middle ground. Ain't no turning around from that. When Jesus went up, listen, when Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17 and 2, the Bible says his face began to shine like the sun and his clothes became uh, white as light. Amen? So Paul says that our glorified bodies will be immortal. Our glorified bodies will be incorruptible. Our glorified bodies will be powerful and glorious. And this amazing condition is what awaits all of us to hang in there, that don't give up, that don't quit, that don't throw in the towel, right? It's called eternal security. It's the objective fact that once a person, I didn't say saved, truly saved, your salvation can't be lost. I'm going to tell you, I, I don't care what nobody says. If you're really saved, you can't walk away. If you're truly saved, you can't quit. You won't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. You won't. I don't care what you go through. You can lose the house, the car, the money. A child can die. Mama can die. You can get a terminal illness of cancer and you can't quit trusting God because you have been truly saved. But those that say, oh, he was a pastor and he walked away from the church, he was never saved. He went to church, he went to the altar, he cried and snotted and rolled in the floor like a bull, but he never truly, he confessed with his mouth that he didn't believe in his heart. Because John said, if they were of us, they would have remained with us. He said, but the mere fact that they departed from us showed that they were never with us in the first place. That's, that's Bible. If you're truly saved, your salvation can't be lost. Sometimes people say, once saved, always saved. And some uh, that follow an Arminian perspective believe that a person can lose their salvation based on certain passages of the Bibles, like in Hebrews 6, it says, uh, for it is impossible uh, to renew the repentance, those who were once enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift, <laughs> who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted, God's good word and the powers of the coming age and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm, they are re-crucifying the son of God and holding him up in contempt. Second Peter 2 and 20 says, for if having escaped the world's impurity through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you are again, you caught up again in the things and defeated 
That means this stuff done took you out. You done went out back out there. You done got caught up in that thing. It done defeated you. It says the last state is worse for them than the first. And then verse 21 says, for it would have been better for you not to have even known the way of righteousness and after knowing it to turn back from the holy command that had been delivered to you. He says this, it has happened to them through uh, the true proverb. What is a proverb? It's a wise saying. The proverb said a dog returns to his own vomit and a washed pig returns to wallowing in the mud. I don't know about y'all, but I ain't no dog. I ain't going back and eating no vomit and I ain't no pig and I ain't finna go wallowing in no mud. I don't care what happens in my life. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. And it's other passages that teach security. Romans 8 and 30 was one of them. We just read it. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those that he justified, he also glorified. And then look at John 10, where Jesus said, 10 and 27, where he said, my sheep hear my voice, right? He said, and I know them, and they follow me. This is, this is powerful. He said, I give them eternal life. Not, not just I gave them. He said, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one, no one, no one, no devil, no imp, no one will snatch them from my hand. Why? He said, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one, he said it again, can snatch them from my father's hand. Jesus said that. As, as Chile used to say, God rest his soul, it's written in red. <laughs> and Chile used to say, it's written in red. That means Jesus said it. And, and, and it ain't really a stronger way to say this. The sheep and we are the sheep of his pasture, will never perish from the hand of an all-powerful God. The Christian, the true Christian, I ain't talking about just playing church, the true Christian is kept for salvation by the power of God. Yeah. Well, how powerful is God? Hmm. See? <laughs> it ain't so much that we keep him, but it's that he's keeping us. Lord, have mercy. Y'all hear me. It ain't so much that we keeping God. God is keeping us. Amen. Well, what about Christians who fall away from the faith? Well, what about them? I seen some people, seen a guy yesterday that he used to go to church with us. He was in the word. I'm talking about he was in the word. Yeah. We, we used to have Bible study together. We used to pray together. And he fell into some sins of immor uh, Im immorality and he stopped going to church. Not just him, but a lot of different people. What happened? And so for people who hold to the teaching of eternal security, two answers are given. And either one of these might be true. The first answer is that, that the person was never saved to begin with. That's the, that's the view I hold. They were never saved to, forget, to begin with. And maybe they participated in church. And maybe they participated in Christian activity, but they never had a genuine conversion experience. Because if you ever been touched by Christ, you'll never be the same. And this is possible in some cases. Somebody like Judas, right? One of the 12 disciples. He participated in Jesus' ministry, but Jesus referred to him as the son of perdition. Amen? Now, the second possibility is that the person had was truly a Christian, but had fallen into serious sin and, and continued sin, prolonged sin and doubt. Now, this don't mean that God has eternally abandoned this person, but God will use discipline. Sometimes, and I've seen this too, to the point of physical death. Yeah, they die. Right? Let me give you some Bible. He did deny Jesus three times, but he was later restored, right? Also, there was a serious case in the Corinthian church, and I think Pastor James taught on this last week. They were abusing the Lord's Supper meeting, and Paul stated, for this reason, many are sick and sleep. What does that mean in the Bible when it says they sleep with their fathers? It's a euphemism for a Christian death. Amen? In both these cases, we got to remember that we have a limited 
an imperfect picture of what spiritually has happened and of what God is doing in people's lives. Related to the doctrine of eternal security is the topic of assurance. Assurance can be defined as the subjective conviction that a believer personally possesses eternal life. And this is important because it's a possibility of false assurance. A person who falsely believes they're going to heaven, but you really ain't. And the possibility that a true Christian can have doubts about him or his or her salvation due to personal sin or misinterpretations of the Bible. John says that it's possible for a believer to have assurance of salvation. This is what John said. I didn't write it. John did. First John chapter 5, verse 11 through 13. He said, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. The one who has the son has eternal life. The one who does not have the son does not have this eternal life. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that so you may know that you have eternal life. Amen? In other words, God wants Christians, real Christians, to know for certain that they're saved. And I'm going to end it with this. The gospel of Christ, it's, it's, it's not good news, it's great news. It's the great news of God providing salvation for man through Jesus Christ. We were lost, but now we've been found. We were guilty, but now we're not guilty. We were unforgiven, but now we have been forgiven. Amen. We were an enemy of God, but now we at peace with God. We had eternal death, but now we have eternal life. God has justified us, saving us from the penalty of sin. He is sanctifying us, saving us from the power of sin. Amen. And finally, in the end, he will glorify us, saving us from the presence of sin. Amen. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Thank you for watching. Um, Y'all be blessed. Hope you got something out.